So, hi everyone. Um, today we have with us Claudia Padovani. Um, she's an Italian scholar who works uh, as an associate professor in political science and international relations, law and international studies department of University of Padova in Italy. In 2015, she was appointed director of the Interdepartmental Center for Gender Studies at this very same university and co-founded the Next Generation Global Studies Initiative. Um, her areas of interest for research deal with the transformation of political processes in the global context and their connection to the evolution of communication dynamics and technologies, including the connection and disconnection between communication, media, and women, as well as gender equality and discrimination, focusing on governing arrangements and social practices. She has published several books and journal articles addressing her research domain, such as Media Gender Equality Regimes, a framework for change published in 2018, also Gender Equality and the Media, a Challenge for Europe, published in 2017, or The Politics of Media Gender Equality, Lessons Learned and Struggles for Change 20 Years After the Beijing Four World Conference on Women, published in 2017 too. Nowadays, apart from her work in Padova University, she is a member of the International Association for Media and Communication, Communication Research, where she chairs, since 2018, the Working Group on Global Media Policy. She is also involved since 2013 in Research and Policy Committee of UNESCO promoted Global Alliance for Media and Gender, and co-coordinates the European Union funded project called Advancing Gender Equality in Media Industries. Moreover, she's an active member of several scholarly international networks, working on media policies and communication governance, such as Euromedia Research Group, or the Unitween University Network on Gender, Media, and ICTS. Finally, she is also a thematic expert of the European Commission regarding scientific analysis and advice on gender equality in the European Union. With such a rich profile and high-level professional experience in gender, media, and politics, all of these plays within a broader framework of globalization. Claudia Padovani is here to conduct the session entitled Gender Equality and Media Regulation, Frameworks, Challenges, and Good Practices. So I leave you with her. Thank you very much. Wow, what an introduction. <laughs> um, so thank you, thank you for having me here. Um, it's a pleasure, an honor. Um, that was a very nice introduction that already tells you a bit of where I would, I would situate uh, my speech as happened yesterday. So it, it's always good that we kind of say where is it that we speak from. And so I will say a few words on, about this uh, um, before introducing. Then I guess I can't really stand up because I would be in front of the screen. I usually like to stand up. And uh, as you all know, we in Italy, we use our hands a lot. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm part of that uh, stereotypical um, scene. Um, I'm pleased to be here also because I'm one of the responsible person for a new master's degree on European and Global Studies that was uh, initiated at the University of Padova this year. And so we are now in conversation with uh, Professor Rosa and with Tony because it may be, I mean, for me, for us, uh, it's very interesting to learn from the experience of these three years uh, that some of you have gone through and also to, to think, you know, what are your perspectives and ambitions um, for the future. And, um, and so hopefully there will be more opportunities for collaboration. So we may meet each other <coughs> in other places and other times. Uh, but as, as it is as of today, so I would like to say um, just a, a few words about myself uh, to integrate was, what was just uh, presented. <coughs> so I'm a, an associate professor at the Department of Politics, Law, and International Studies. And I have uh, a mixed background. So I've been working on international development cooperation for a few years uh, uh, while I was doing my PhD. So the academic work is part of my experience, uh, but I also have been working with NGOs and international NGOs. And so I do believe that is uh, an important part of uh, uh, my own background. And the way I do work at the university somehow reflects that. Uh, which was, of course, many years ago, but it was uh, my training with globalization as it was happening through the 90s. Mm? Uh, and possibly my, hello, welcome. Hi. 
So my own interest uh, with global issues uh, uh, derives uh, not just uh, from you know, literature and, and scholarly work, but also from some experiences of engagement with the world uh, and try to understand that. Um, so I come from an international relation perspective. I've always been in, interested in communication. So communication governance somehow became my major topic. But for a number of reasons and kind of casual, um, about 20 years ago, I was involved uh, with a major, hello, welcome, uh, a major international project that I will mention, which is called uh, Global Media Monitoring Project. Uh, and it's a monitoring project on the representation of women and men uh, in newsmaking uh, around the world. And I was coordinating the Italian team uh, for this international project that I will speak more to, uh, and that's how I got involved with gender. So I am not a gender, uh, I don't have a gender study background, so I come from a different field. But then gender gradually and gender issues and gender inequalities and gender mainstreaming have become a main part, a major part of uh, my research work, particularly over the last uh, 10 years. So I've been involved in some international European projects that I will also mention. Um, I am involved in some of these networks uh, that were mentioned, and of course, uh, if you have a long list, uh, it really sounds like a long list. So in the course of my presentation, I will try to, um, I, one of my goals uh, is uh, to help you get a sense uh, of how all these initiatives uh, are actually happening in a global context. Uh, and how gender and media are being addressed uh, in different venues by different actors uh, through different types of dynamics. So I think it's, uh, it's quite interesting that what the second presentation you had yesterday, were you all here yesterday afternoon? Yes? So the second presentation stressed very much this whole point of having different, many different actors uh, being part of a dynamic uh, which is of course made of complexity. I would say, you know, when we discuss gender media issues and initiatives uh, to promote gender equality, we face uh, um, a similar situation as far as understanding who are these actors and what they're doing, but also what kind of issues are being addressed. And to my understanding also, how do we frame those issues? How do we not just uh, address a problem, but how do we create the problem by framing the problem in a certain manner. So as you can tell, I come from kind of a constructivist uh, perspective, which I think is quite interesting um, in this respect. So on the basis of uh, uh, the experience and the kind of work that I'm doing, and I will tell you more as we uh, go through the presentation, this is the structure of the presentation. I'm not really sure we'll get to the end because as it happens, maybe we'll be interrupted, maybe you want to ask questions. I won't be waiting until the very end before you can ask questions, so uh, please uh, tell me if you have like urgent matters or if you want to make comments on the things I say. But my idea is uh, we go through these uh, like three parts. So the first part very much is uh, why do we think of gender, media, and ICT as a global issue? Is it a global issue? How can we understand this as a global issue? And to me, the point is uh, we live immersed in a media environment, in a communication environment. We are all very um, capable and expert in using different types of media, you possibly more than myself. So we live surrounded by images and languages, uh, uh, ways of making news, ways of framing things. Uh, and it has, kind of, it has become kind of a natural environment. So unless we are media communication students and scholars, sometimes we kind of give things for granted. We take them as natural. So my point in saying we do have some global issues here is to highlight how we may be deconstructing some of that natural environment. Mm? The second part, uh, I would like to speak about some of the frameworks uh, that have been developed at the global level um, in order to address uh, existing and persisting inequalities uh, in and through the media. And because you come from a global studies uh, 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 de degree, I think it's interesting to identify some of the institutions uh, that have been and are still involved and engaged uh, with addressing gender inequality issues uh, uh, when it comes to communication. So kind of map out uh, what is out there. Hmm? 
so if we look at things globally, what is the framework? What are the principles? What are the mechanisms? What are the institutions? How do we understand this? And this, to me, I think, and that's how you, you realize that the title of my presentation is uh, uh, not just related to gender and media, but to global frameworks, uh, hmm? because I do have a specific interest in one aspect uh, of the gender and media connection and disconnection, which is not very explored uh, uh, by literature, and that is the policy dimension, okay? So we'll come to this. It may be something that resonates more to some of you more interested in international relations uh, or maybe communication. But as I said, if you have questions or if I'm not clear in my presentation, just let me know. And then the last part, I would like to uh, talk a bit about good practices, some of the interesting practices that have been developed uh, around the world, uh, again, to address the issue. We have more chairs here if you need them. Huh? If you want to sit on chairs, you just take them. <laughs> As you wish, if you're comfortable. Um, and so, so my last part, actually, I would like to, to, to speak specifically about one practice, uh, which is uh, an ongoing uh, project uh, which has been funded by the European Commission that I'm currently co-coordinating with Professor Karen Ross from the University of Newcastle in the UK. And that is a project on advancing gender equality in media industries. Uh, um, and again, I will say more about that, but I will take you through the platform uh, to show you some of the resources that we have created. So we could stay maybe five hours uh, going through all this. Uh, we can stop, we can skip some parts. But before we do, I would like to invite you to do a little exercise, uh, because of course I can speak for very long. Um, uh, and, and there are many things that I can say that maybe you're already familiar with. Uh, I don't know, we've never met. Uh, so I invite you to do a little exercise, either in couples, just talk to the person next to you, or in small groups. Hmm? You can do like three or four of you. So my first question is, uh, do not take for granted what I say that we do have inequalities uh, uh, in the gender media relations. So the first question is, uh, do we think that there are inequalities, uh, that there are problems, that there are issues, uh, uh, that there are forms of discrimination? And if you think that there are issues uh, and problematic issues, uh, how would you frame those? So if you think of your own experience uh, as uh, you know, users of media, as producers of content, as readers of newspaper, uh, offline or online, uh, just think a bit on the basis of you know, knowledge and experience. Uh, how would you frame uh, gender and media issues uh, nowadays? Yeah? Like five minutes, something quick that you have to do. And maybe you can write that down in a sentence. If you agree with your, your neighbor, um, just one sentence or one keyword. Please? Maybe we can collect back. <laughs> I know I could leave a, a lot more time. To me, it's fantastic to hear all this energy. And of course, but I, I don't want you to solve all the issues. Please. You're not stealing mine, there's still a chair here. Um, so you, you can't solve everything because otherwise I wouldn't have anything to say. So we can start maybe collecting a few ideas. Uh, we'll just go around the room. Anybody who wants to, to speak. And uh, we, we just collect uh, either keywords uh, or uh, you know, a comment, uh, something you know, starting from this corner. Uh, speaking loud. Yeah, so we were speaking about. Uh, can you say your name as you speak? Yeah, my name is Ido. And. Uh, Maria, so we were uh, discussing about uh, um, from our different backgrounds because I study a lot of masters at Polino that is based on uh, media representation. Mm -hmm. So basically, we're speaking like on one hand, what they have studied, like um, there's under representation, for example, in the boards at the news, like there's some more, let's say, visibility uh, of men as a respectable figure, while females they uh, are more focused on, let's say, uh, their appearance, so whether they look good or not. Mm -hmm. And for example, from my my background of studies, <coughs> we study more like gender role representation, let's say in cinema, series, uh, video games, publicity, and you see like how media always um, reproduce uh, roles of, let's say, traditional female that is willing to get married, uh, that heterosexual uh, background, she falls in love, uh, uh, romantic love leads, and all these issues. So, of course, there's a problem with. Okay, and we already have like two main points here. Um, anybody who would like to add uh, something? Um, we more or less discussed this and we um, said that um, sometimes we should look at it for something in the academic 
Uh, uh, sorry, who, who comes from a media communication background? Mm -hmm. And do you have gender courses in your, um, in your uh, degree? Mm -hmm. Gender and media? Yes. Okay. That's my own personal survey. I'll tell you why. Okay, please. So, so for example, um, we need to study that in academic career, like, for example, um, a professor could be evaluated for um, his, uh, his knowledge, and for example, in the case of the female um, teachers, they would be more uh, knowledge for their appearance or their physical features. So um, sometimes the, the quality of, of a professor um, can be more. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's the substance versus uh, appearance uh, and look. Um, the back row? Uh, we also mentioned, just to complete the idea of mm -hmm. the report, uh, intersectionality. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a very precious, it's very, I think it's very important. It's something that is coming up in the literature, but it has not been as important at the international level when these issues are being discussed. And so I'm stressing this because I think it's important that we also think the knowledge that we share here, the knowledge that you produce, the knowledge that we produce with our research, where, is, where does it go? And in many cases, uh, when we talk about policy and we think in terms of you know, policy to address gender inequalities, of course, there are knowledges that are produced within universities that should be channeled. That, that would have been my question also to the first speaker yesterday, because she's been an academic, she's also been working for IO, IO, IOL, um, and, and I think sometime we need to be you as being like future leaders and future, you know, um, in, in uh, important positions in your profession, this whole point of how is knowledge shared and how is knowledge translated and the kind of translation that we need is just something to keep in mind. Okay, so we have a representation issue. Uh, we also mentioned like the role and positions uh, that are occupied and how these different positions are actually reflected and represented. Anything else from like first row here? The content. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> um, we're talking about different issues. Uh, I want to mention just to the letter uh, or Ms. Hart commented about uh, the idea that many women have to face more things on men. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. than what they are saying. And we are, like, well, when we watch a TV program, what I'm aware as a, you know, as a audience, I want to be aware about what they are saying, not about the image, if she's wearing a jacket or not a jacket. Uh -huh. women, but this is the reality that they have to face. So at least they have to face that, okay, I have, I have done my homework to, to get to the TV program or whatever, and then I have, okay, I have to face that. So they have to... We'll come back to this because that's an interesting comment, uh, which is actually very pertinent to what we will see afterwards, so thanks. So it's not just the look, but it's the look combined to all the different challenges uh, um, going through, not just for those uh, working within the media, but also for those being represented. So again, this whole point of content on the one side uh, and then participation in media on the other side. Anything from second row? So maybe she wants to say it herself? Please, it's interesting to all of us.
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we can maybe define this uh, and summarize in terms of where does authority resides and whose authority is recognized. Um, also pay attention to the fact that this very, this very point of who's speaking uh, and who's speaking for whom and, and the tendency or the facility that men, including men like interviewed in the news, uh, they have to speak for a broader audience. Uh, we'll come back to this also, but it's a, it's a very general thing. It's not just in, in news. Uh, hmm? Okay, like two, three more uh, comments and then we'll move on with the presentation. Anybody who's got something like urgent, different, or to add uh, to what has been said? Please. You, you, I saw you were involved in a, in a dense conversation, so please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is the sector in which most of the mainstream translators have both the responsibility of the But most of the issues that we see in the go countries where the question provides regarding the gender. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, it, this is also an interesting comment, but I would like to point to the fact that we're, we're actually seeing and listening more and more to female war correspondent, and because of the specific threats that they, um, that they experience, uh, uh, international organization like International Federation of Journalists, uh, they are developing tools uh, and resources and guidelines which are particularly targeted at female correspondent, women correspondents. So some of these issues are being addressed by the professional association. Uh, I mentioned International Federation of Journalists. Another interesting organization is the International uh, Women's Media Foundation that's based in the US. Uh, and they do promote a lot uh, the kind of professionals, uh, uh, women's professional uh, from the media, also with a very specific accent to those uh, who are working in war zone. I was actually inviting a comment from the two of you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Simplifies complexity. Mm -hmm. And uh, this also means that many people that live out of these boundaries for a living are excluded from this way of living. Okay, yeah. So I, I think any, anybody else wants to add uh, something that you were discussing that's different? Uh, we actually didn't discuss this. We are looking at a lot of issues related to women. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's important. Um, just to, to give us an example, uh, during the, the, the weekend, I just watched the documentary on mass media, mm -hmm. and it was really impressive because it was a completely different vision of gender as well, but applied uh, to mass communities. So, so 
Yes. I think it relates a lot. I think that the whole, the, your, your last uh, uh, few comments uh, to me resonates to the very role of media in a democratic society, which is very much about bringing all the different voices. And so whatever voice is not heard uh, on according to what the speakers uh, would like to say and the ways in which they would like to say, that of course is a problem. So that relates to gender. It relates to different aspects of gender, including intersectionality, and relates, of course, to different minorities. Okay, um, so thanks for this. I think it was important to have a sense of uh, how we all experience. Uh, we are all somehow aware of some of the issues. Uh, often we may be uh, observe, uh, we may feel that we don't, we don't have like uh, resources or capacity uh, to respond to something which is not um, correct. Uh, the more we become aware, of course, the more we also need tools uh, to respond. Uh, and so I think that is uh, something for us to keep in mind. But before we come to tools uh, and what can be done, I think it's, uh, it's good for us uh, to have uh, a general sense of uh, what you have been talking about. So we have uh, general comments. Uh, we have a feeling because we are all uh, you know, part of an audience or different audiences. Uh, we may be more or less aware, but I think having an idea of some of the numbers and some of the data that come from international studies uh, provide like a more specific uh, sense of the, um, the kind of issue and the problem. And also the, um, let's say, um, an e explanation of uh, why this may be considered as a, as a global uh, problem and a global issue. So here I may, anybody has heard about this project ever? GMMP? <coughs> okay. So um, you do have a communication course in this degree. Okay. So this is my invitation for you maybe uh, next year. Uh, I will say something about the project. I will say something about the results, so what kind of uh, data we get from the project, and then uh, a call for international collaboration. So you may consider you may be involved uh, in the next round. Now, GMMP is the longest and largest uh, international monitoring project that has been dealing specifically with gender uh, representation and also professional roles uh, in the news media. So it's very specific to the news media. No advertising, no fiction, no movies. The fact that this is on news uh, to me is very important because when we look at advertising, we tend to think uh, we know it's advertising. So it can be visionary, it can be fictional, it can be a distortion of reality, which often happens. Uh, and also when we see fiction. But when we listen to the news, uh, and the news is like quick, uh, and we have uh, like prime time on TV uh, every evening or you watch on, online, uh, basically you're expecting the newscast uh, to tell you about reality, right? So we, we don't have the kind of filter or the critical filter that we normally have uh, when we're uh, considering some other genre. So with the news, uh, what is interesting is that this is, of course, uh, it's global. Uh, it's global. We have outlets uh, in different places. The Global Media Monitoring Project came out uh, as uh, an attempt to provide, for the first time in 1995, uh, a picture, uh, like an, a global picture of where women and men uh, were sitting or were actually being represented in the news media. And here I'm making a connection to something that was mentioned yesterday afternoon. So uh, we will see this also, there's kind of historical thread. But 1995, of course, was important because of Beijing. And when you have anything like an international event um, of this magnitude, mm, and Beijing was actually the fourth in a row of, uh, of world conferences on women, so there was a whole build-up of two decades, uh, from Mexico 75 to Beijing in 95. Then you have, uh, that becomes like an opportunity for different groups to mobilize, uh, to raise issue. Now in this case, Beijing uh, was seen uh, by a number of uh, journalists, professionals, academics from around the world uh, as a place uh, where all the issues concerning women and men, women particularly at the time in the media and their representation and the stereotypes uh, and the invisibility of voices uh, that should have been placed on the international agenda on that very moment. And we will see why Beijing is so important. So in, in my next... Uh, <coughs> part. But what was very clear to these women who were coming from different countries and different regions of the world was uh, that yes, in 1995, of course, there had been many studies conducted in different places. Uh, 
But all these studies were maybe based in the US or based in Europe or maybe also in, in India and Southeast Asia, but there was no international comparative study. And so they decided to create a framework to have precisely a kind of study that could be conducted at the international level involving a number of countries. Now, 1994 was the first edition and the participation there was of 78 countries. And then it has been reproduced, it has been reconducted every five years uh, since. Uh, so the last edition was 2015, uh, and 114 countries participated. So based on the same methodology, the methodology is quite simple because it is meant to be conducted in different countries, uh, not just by expert uh, uh, researchers, uh, but sometimes by NGOs. You may have professional you know, journalist NGOs or NGO feminist NGOs working at the grassroots level. So the idea is that in order to acquire some kind of competence in monitoring the media, what happens in the media, you can have a simple methodology and you learn how to become critical in relation to the media. And at the same time, the methodology can then be reused for other, um, for other instances. So basically what GMMP has done has been to look um, according to this methodology that we may go into some of the details uh, if you're interested in, but I certainly invite you to go and check their website. Website is uh, www.whomakesthenews.org. That is the name, uh, Global Media Monitoring Project. And what you see here is uh, one of the basic highlight. So we have a world uh, which is of course made of women and men. Women and men are experiencing different roles and different situations in different contexts. Uh, nevertheless, we have seen uh, lots of improvements in different societies, including our own, uh, over the years. Uh, how much of, this, of these achievements that have been made uh, in fostering gender equality are actually reflected in the media? To what extent uh, are uh, women and men speaking and what role they have uh, when they're speaking? Okay? So what the GMMP does uh, is uh, to take a picture of only one day. So from a methodological point of view, it's just a single shot. But the interesting thing is that you have 20 years of investigation that are telling you from India to different places in Latin America, how are the news media doing in relation to representing uh, gender, right? So what came out in 1995, 17% uh, of all the subjects that were represented in the news uh, were women, which means, of course, 83% were men. And then you see the improvement over the years. Yes, there is some improvement, but the improvement is very, very slow. And between uh, 2010 and 2015, uh, there was a question mark here because this was before the last edition, no improvement at all. Okay? So we are today in a situation where the world media, the news media around the world, uh, in average, uh, show a quarter of the subjects uh, as women, women performing different roles, uh, and the rest uh, is male. Now I'm showing you quickly just to give a sense of what this, uh, like if we unpack this, uh, and we are only talking about a representation. Hmm? Uh, so the main issue that came about, it's about stereotypes, uh, it's about the voices, visibility, invisibility. This were the results for Italy. We have a team in Italy. Uh, we've been working with different universities and some organization. My students have always been involved, and I'm mentioning this because uh, there will be a 2020 edition coming up. So GMMP is already been planned uh, for the next year, and I think that if you link uh, to whoever is uh, coordinating this in Spain, it may be interesting for some of you to maybe consider, you can participate. Okay, in Italy you see that who makes the news? Uh, this is uh, uh, somehow less than the average for traditional media. So it's less than the 24%, okay? On, the, on internet and Twitter, it's slightly more. But if you break that down and you go and see what type of media, so where do we find more women? Where do we find... Um, um, in, in relation to the type of media, then you see that internet, this is online news, uh, 
this is the online uh, website of uh, major newspapers. So we were looking at the print version and we were looking at online version. And you have uh, like more women in this, uh, in this case. Uh, Twitter seems to be of all the type of media, the media where you have least representation. So we can't really say that the digital media are being more inclusive. Hmm? So when, when you have this kind of data, you can compare across countries uh, and you can compare through history. And it's interesting to notice where the changes uh, have happened. Now, the second thing I think is interesting is uh, when is it that women make the news? So we have like uh, one fourth uh, of the chart, hmm? which is women and the rest is men. But then that 24, 21, 27 uh, percent is actually made uh, of women being uh, subject uh, either as uh, protagonists or voices uh, in different types of news. And what you can see here is that this is the Italian case, so there is something here that needs to be explained. But of course, the orange is always uh, the women. And you see that in, when you're talking about so-called hard news, so that is economy, that is politics, uh, the percentage, of course, is lower. And then the percentage gets higher when you come to either celebrities, uh, hmm, not so much sports, but celebrities for sure, or social issues. In this case, uh, why do we have so many women here? As I said, this is a picture in a day. And the day that was one day in February 19, uh, 2015 that we took this picture in Italy, Angelina Jolie had just announced that she was going to go through surgery to prevent from breast cancer. So in that case, in terms of newsworthiness, uh, it's a celebrity uh, presenting herself uh, and that kind of screw the, the result for this. Uh, so this would also have been much lower, okay? But the point here is to say we have uh, news uh, that are really heavy and that are important because that sets the scene for the political debate, for the public debate, uh, and then you have a number of other uh, issues being dealt uh, and there is where you find normally more women. This is the Italian case, but if you look at the global reports, and all reports uh, are, of course, online on the website, then you would find something similar. And the other interesting thing is uh, what kind of role do these uh, subjects play? Um, again, this is the Italian case, but it's very, very similar to anything that you would find. Go search for the Spanish report, for instance, or reports from the countries that you come from. Normally, you do have uh, men expressing either as spokesperson or the expert. There was a comment here that was made about the expert. Now, what you would find still very common in Italian newscast, for instance, is that you have the usual yearly flu. And if you have a flu, of course, you are interviewing a doctor to explain what is happening. In that case, still very often, the authority of the medical, vo the medical authority would be a man. Very often, now check this in over the last week, I'm just giving you a suggestion. When you're looking at a newscast, uh, maybe some of you still watch TV? Do you? <laughs> okay, whatever newscast uh, uh, you're following, but just check what happens. Uh, if, you're, if the interviewee is a man, very often this is a person with a name and affiliation and the type of expertise. Uh, and if it's a woman, much more likely this would be kind of somebody being interviewed at the market in the street expressing kind of popular, popular knowledge or the public, uh, you know, general knowledge. So these kind of different roles uh, is a way of showing, I mean, I'm, I'm saying here the, exactly the same things that you were saying before. It's about roles, uh, it's about forms of representation, it's about the idea of, uh, um, let's say, competence uh, that the, the news media are uh, transmitting in their forms of representation, which are all very often implicit. Uh, hmm? Now, this is uh, how things have uh, changed over the years, uh, and this is, of course, impossible to read like here, but I invite you to look at this because this is an overview of 20 years of global media monitoring and what has happened in different regions of the world. So, for instance, uh, if you look here, uh, you have uh, the greater increase, uh, the greatest increase over the 20 years in Latin America. Why? because a number of females have become leaders of different countries. So, of course, if you do have more women, that is one of the issues that is normally raised. So is this, uh, so you don't have women in politics because women are still a lot less involved in politics. That's not always the case. 
Uh, you may be aware of the fact that in Rwanda, for instance, you have in parliament uh, more women than men. So women are like uh, above 50% uh, as parliamentarians. Uh, but the Rwandan uh, result for the GMMP are exactly the same as this. So how can that be? If you do have women who are involved in policy, still the media. So the point is the media are not representing reality even when they are showing what is actually happening. And then we have uh, the quality of the comments that are made, and I'm, I'm here coming to what you were just saying. I go quickly through this, because this is just to give us a sense uh, that the, kind, the comments you were making, which are all correct, uh, they can be translated or uh, like, uh, um, integrated with these kind of analysis, uh, providing us uh, a more systematic idea of how the media are working. Now, one thing is, uh, uh, the, you know, the look and the substance. And of course, uh, there is a lot more attention that's paid on, uh, and here we're talking about female politicians, important female politicians uh, performing very important roles. Uh, this is not about Brexit, this is about Theresa May and the fact that she likes dresses or she likes shoes, right? So this is also a way of paying attention, not so much to her thinking, her ideas. We can agree or not agree, but the point is, uh, how the media perform, represent uh, this kind of figure, nothing like this would ever happen for a man, right? And not because men do not like dresses. I think many of them, mm, they also like. Second point is this. Uh, so why do you focus your attention on something which is very much, uh, you know, focusing on a specific part of the body, sexualizing? Now, here an, an anecdote uh, from a few years back. Um, a few years back in Italy, we had a, go uh, a new government that was elected, uh, and the new government uh, was uh, at the time of Romano Prodi, so let's say uh, me, um, that was uh, when, when, uh, after Berlusconi, so 2006, let's say. So some of the ministers in this government <coughs> were actually female, and some of them were young female. And then the day after, when you, you have the main page of the newspaper, you open up pages two and three, all the different uh, people who have been appointed and then uh, they gave uh, uh, their uh, uh, juramento, juramento. So they were giving their pledge mm, in front of the President of the Republic. Uh, and then the picture is taken. And there was one picture, the Corriere della Sera is like uh, the most uh, diffused uh, newspaper in Italy. So it's a national newspaper with wide coverage. Uh, mm. And the second page, uh, one of the pictures was uh, one of these female ministers uh, who just bended to collect something from the ground. And the picture was taken of her décolleté. So, I've, you know, it, it has nothing to do with the very fact that she was there. She was occupying a specific place with the competence and expertise. Uh, and then, of course, the media are picking up these uh, little things. So it's not just May. This happens. Um, and, and just to give you a sense, that one day I felt I had to write to the, uh, to the editor. And so I, you know, I did write this email. And because I was a, uh, I was a researcher at my university, I felt uh, I should let my boss know that I'm doing this, uh, just in case, uh, mm, if anybody comes back and, and maybe they want to argue on this. Uh, and I realized that the person who was in charge of the degree that I was teaching in uh, didn't even notice. So he said, oh, yes, uh, oh, yeah, I didn't, you know, I didn't notice this. And this was a communication degree. So this is to say that we are so much surrounded by things that we take for granted that you need to have this kind of uh, critical view uh, more and more. Again, mm, you have, of course, the first one on the, on the left uh, is real. The second one is a fake, uh, and it's a way of like reverting just to show us uh, what would it feel and what would it look uh, if instead of making comments on the legs of prime minister and the person who is in charge of um, you know, a major party in Scotland, then we would be uh, using the same kind of approach to men, right? So this is something that we, we, we take, we see. Mm? Um, okay. Uh, there's one thing, so images matter a, a lot uh, as a way of showing what is the substance of what we're talking about here. And the fact that women are, as you were saying, what is your name again? Jordi. A lot more exposed, so they do perform this challenge. Now, I was talking to my colleague Karen Ross uh, from Newcastle, and she does research. These are uh, um, the, the previous one are her pictures, uh, so she uses that because she does work on uh, female politicians and political communication that involves uh, women and men. And so we, we were having this conversation at some point, which was precisely the point that you were making. 
So if you are uh, a, a woman in politics, uh, you know from the very beginning that whatever you wear, you will be commented upon. And it will be your, either your look or your family. You will be asked questions like, uh, how do you combine uh, family life uh, and work? Uh, questions that would never be asked uh, to a male prime minister. So th this is recurrent. Uh, but the whole point of the look is, uh, you need to know when you go out in the morning that if you're you know, dressed in formal or formal or too formal, some kind of criticism will come to you, right? So think that if anybody is thinking about entering politics. Mm. So this is a very Italian kind of thing. And here I would like to know your uh, comments and ideas. Language, of course, uh, matters a lot. In Italian, we have, uh, as, you, as uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, Spanish and in Catalan, maschile e femminile. And I am using this in Italian just because I think it's easy enough to understand. But in Italian, uh, we're still using very much in the media language uh, which is not as inclusive. So we use this uh, maschile as a universal neutral term. Okay? I understand that in, in Spain, uh, you would be saying professora. We have nothing like this in Italy as far as the common practice. So of course, uh, we have professore and uh, professoressa. Most of my, like, colleagues, a uh, full professor, they would uh, call themselves a professore. So the dean of my department is Elena Pariotti, clearly a female, but she uses the professor Elena Pariotti. And the same would go if you are an ingegnere, if you are an architetto, if you are a giudice. Now giudice, of course, you have il giudice e la giudice. The term is the same. But the point is, uh, is uh, um, the way we understand this, uh, that because uh, traditionally many of these prestigious positions and, and professions were not uh, um, occupied by women, we have not yet come to a use of the language which would be grammatically correct, but we're not used to the practice. So reality and society have moved forward, but the language is still kind of backward. Um, and so I'm, I'm always, when I speak to people like Spanish speaking, I'm always curious uh, if you do find uh, maybe different examples, uh, but that reflect still. Because what, what happens in Italy is, for instance, these are, uh, it's uh, almost impossible to read. But the point is uh, <coughs> the same uh, piece of news uh, that concern uh, um, like uh, the, the uh, one of the examples is, for instance, there was a, a mayor at some point, um, a female mayor of a small village, uh, who was uh, who became pregnant, and uh, and of course, uh, if uh, il sindaco è incinta, which is pregnant. So if you're using the masculine, then uh, you have to use uh, some coordination for the grammar, right? So either you say il sindaco, though of course uh, this was a woman, è incinto, you can't say because it's impossible uh, in nature, right? So you would say il sindaco è incinta. So you would have all these kind of discordances uh, in the language. Uh, which are nevertheless used. But I think it's interesting because it's a signal of the fact that we are going through interesting times uh, when the language uh, start being changed uh, is because uh, there are transformation in a much uh, um, under, underground uh, level. So any like sp Spanish uh, uh, kind of example that we can add uh, to this uh, sindaco in Cinto? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so that, that's a reflection of what I was saying. Um, I think the, so here, here is another example, and this is a, a quote from Laud, Laura Boldrini, who was the president of the lower chamber, the president of the cham chamber of deputies uh, until uh, um, like last year. 
and she has actually being a president of the chamber as a woman she has been attacked so violently on digital media on the social media that she started developing her own strategies uh, by actually shaming those uh, who were sending these like horrifying threats to her like really violent right so and she was actually intervening on this language thing by saying that uh, the language is important because if, uh, if women are at the vertex of institution, they have a role, uh, and so their role as a female occupying the role should be recognized. Um, it may seem like a small <coughs> things, uh, but it's not just the fact that you have, uh, you, the language is a system, and so the system has uh, harmony and order, and so it would be just so easy to stay within the system. Now, when we suggest, uh, we, we, like in, in public conversation, we suggest that you may be using the word avvocata, what's wrong, or ingegnera. The first comment that comes very often also from women, uh, maybe, uh, you know, p uh, being professionals in that profession, is that it sounds uh, bad. Which, of course, has nothing to do with the linguistic and the language as a, as a correct grammatical system. So the, the, the bad sound, and so you can think, okay, you have lots of words uh, in Italian and maybe also in Spanish uh, which do not have a nice sound. Uh, cyberbullism, ciberbullismo, is that nice? Uh, that's awful. But we take that because uh, there is no tradition that prevents, right? So I'm, I'm talking about things like this. Now, this is, oh, any other comment or, or examples? Like here in Spain, we have three countries in the economy. In, sorry? Like here in Spain, especially with rules, mm -hmm. because like, I think like in Italian or Portuguese, rules are always masculine. So it became like popular to do both, like masculine and feminine, especially in politicians, like those who do that, and all that. Mm -hmm. And then the Real Academia Española, which is like the institution that regulates Spanish, said that that was wrong, that it has to be masculine always. Mm -hmm. So there's been like a um, counter reaction to that, like a lot of people Okay, and, and based on your observatory as young people, students uh, with bright minds, uh, where, where do you think your countries stand in relation to, to this issue of language? Because I, I, can, I think it's interesting in Italy that we are witnessing some transformation and also some assumption of responsibility by media professionals themselves. So the ordine dei giornalisti adopting maybe guidelines on the use of language. Many uh, municipalities and local administration doing the same. University of Padova has uh, developed a booklet on how to use, uh, like for a fair use and inclusive use of language, which needs to include a number of examples I mean, people who are working in the offices and the administration, mm, they need to be provided with like a quick thing. <coughs> Just say, can I use this? When you're doing like a report of a meeting or uh, you know, a commission, there is a call for position for recruitment, so all that. So wh where do you think you stand <coughs> in the debate? And it is so much, uh, that's correct, but it's so much, uh, I won't stay too long on this because we could have a whole course on language, uh, but I think it's so much a matter of concept uh, and the very meaning that you attribute and this, uh, associate to this, uh, that I think it's not only men who would not accept uh, the use of the feminine. And, and here another anecdote. Uh, I am a member of the Italian Political Science Association, and I was in the steering committee for a few years. Uh, and by chance, uh, we were to change the statutes. So we were actually going through the document. And so me being there, I suggested 
you know, this is all written in the masculine. And we have lots of uh, like younger colleagues, uh, female, uh, coming into the association. So let's make them feel that they belong. And let's make us feel that we belong. So I'm not this. Mm? And, so, and so the proposal was uh, to redraft. So me and a colleague of mine, we did a whole exercise uh, in redrafting using both, of course, uh, so the masculine and feminine, where possible. Sometimes you have to change the sentence so that you use persona instead of using men or you know, things like this. And then in the end, uh, the move uh, was so badly conducted uh, by the, the then president, who was a woman, who said, uh, yes, but you know, this is all very heavy because uh, you have all this feminine and masculine, so how do we do? Let's just suggest that we're going to use uh, the feminine, full stop. And of course, there was like a rebellion in the assembly, so that the, the whole proposal was totally rejected by both men and women. So it's still very delicate, but I think it's interesting to observe. Okay, let's move on. Mm. Um, so, okay, so um, that's... <sighs> mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so... When we talk about Beijing, are you, do you need like two minutes break? No, can I go on? Okay. Uh, so I said Beijing conference was very important and it was important not only because uh, this one project that I mentioned, Global Media Monitoring Project came about uh, and it provided. So what the GMMP did was uh, for the first time, an international study was conducted and then all those uh, delegates uh, that were coming to Beijing and then it was more than 30,000 women from grassroots and NGOs that participated. So they conveyed, some of these professionals, they conveyed the message that something had to be done on media and communication. And so the result was uh, that in the platform for action that came out of Beijing, uh, there is a whole section which is devoted to media and communication. Uh, the plat have you seen the platform for action? Anybody has read that document? Mm -hmm. So maybe that is interesting for you as uh, you know, the gender and globalization, because of course Beijing is a milestone. And Beijing developed a platform for action, which, we, which is not just a declaration, it's a platform with 12 critical areas about education, about work, about violence, uh, about poverty, and about the media. So for the first time, the international community recognized that the media had a very important role to play in achieving gender equality. And so that was included in Section J. Section J, which is this one part of the platform, deals with two aspects. Uh, I have a quote there, but I can leave you the presentation also, uh, in, in PDF maybe. So the first one is about uh, having same opportunities for men and women to access uh, the media and ICT, including decision-making position. So I'm coming back uh, to the very first comment that was made here, that you need to know who is in charge. And who is in charge uh, still very often in the media are uh, uh, men. When you're talking about the CEO of a company, the president, the members of the board, uh, those who sit in high position in the different units uh, of news uh, or media outlets. And the second aspect of the Beijing platform uh, was about uh, dignified uh, and non-stereotypical representation. So Beijing remains a reference uh, because they identified these two poles which are exactly the points that you have raised. One is about content and the way men and women and different uh, diver diverse voices are represented. And the other one is access to the places where decisions are taken. So that has been very clear for uh, 25 years. And the point for us is uh, where do we stand after 25 years? Uh, which may lead to issue in terms of, uh, you know, is it relevant that we have this, Beijing platform, blah, 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 is that useful? That is part of the question and answers. But here, I would like to show you a few data that come from a different study. This was conducted at the European level. It's a recent study, almost recent, 2012 and 13. And in this case, uh, it was uh, a call for tender by the European Institute for Gender Equality, EIGE you may have heard. Have you? Okay, write that down. Uh, E-I-G-E. E -I -G -E. Uh, that's the branch of the European Commission that deals with gender equality. 
um, I won't tell you the whole story, but we ended up uh, conducting this, uh, this uh, study for EGE. The study was uh, about uh, access to decision-making position. So we looked at 28 uh, European countries, 99 media organizations, all the public service media, and the major uh, private service media in order to identify who were uh, sitting at the top. Hmm? Uh, I'll go a bit quick through this, uh, but this is to give you a sense that the media, of course, it's a crucial sector for democracy, but it's also a very important economic sector. As many other economic sectors, uh, you would find when you go and look at top managerial position, this kind of one-third women presence. Hmm? when you're looking at uh, the boards, uh, the councils. Uh, but when you look at the very top position, so the president of RAI at the time uh, happened to be a woman. That was the first time in history. Uh, and then the second person coming after her uh, was also a woman, and that was the second time in history, and now it's again a man. So think of your own uh, country, think of the public service media, and, and think if you know who is the person in charge, uh, the CEO or the president. And this is the kind of study that we conducted. <coughs> Just to see that, yes, of course, there is a, uh, a smaller number of women who are occupying all the different steps. Very often, they are in charge of uh, uh, human resources unit, uh, communication and external relation unit. They're not uh, you know, in charge of the strategy of the foreign affairs. Uh, hmm? So there is a division of labor even at that level. But particularly when you look at the position at the top, uh, I mean, this 14 percentage, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, it's shameful. And this is us. Where we know that in Europe, uh, um, okay, I'm, I'm skipping this, but what I wanted to say is that uh, uh, public media are doing better, slightly better, precisely because they have a mandate. They have a public mandate to operate according to the law to be reflective and representative of the different voices. Huh? So private media are not doing that well. Nevertheless, uh, the situation is problematic. And here again, I'm just throwing this in because Beijing was 25 years ago and we didn't have no internet, uh, I mean, beginning of internet, no social media, uh, you know, the very early stage of digital developments. Uh, but now we're facing a new number of different challenges. And the challenges are uh, in terms of content and in terms of uh, participation and access. Uh, but the challenges are also about the knowledge, uh, the skills. Uh, so when we speak about the digital divides in relation to media and ICT, we need to adopt a much broader framework and understanding of the different forms uh, of inequality. And here, just to show you based on uh, like visual very, very quick, uh, this is gender composition of teams uh, that are producing software packages. So how many teams are uh, made of just women and made of just men and the very small percentage of uh, mixed teams? Now, you have, of course, uh, a background to that and you have consequences to that. I'm just, I'm just throwing suggestions uh, to say that the situation now is much more complicated than it was uh, at the time of Beijing. And this is also another issue, which is uh, uh, ownership. So where do we find women being involved uh, as uh, uh, you know, financial uh, support, the financial resources, the owners uh, of the media that are being created. Now think of the biggest media and ICT companies that you know. Hardly you see any, any women on top there. So the digital context uh, is, is uh, fostering an uh, even broader issue. Okay, so just read the yellow thing. 40 years, uh, so we're talking about a long-term project. It's been there for many, many years. It has been recognized uh, at the international level for many years. So before Beijing, uh, the Mexico Conference on Women, the beginning of the decade of women, 75-85, uh, it was a, re a recognition uh, that this was an issue. And then over the years, uh, this is uh, European Parliament. Uh, uh, it's a study that was published in 2018. So we're still dealing with the issue, but the issue has multiplied. We're talking about gender pay gap, gender-based discrimination, sexual harassment, all forms of abuse, decision-making levels, the media content, the stereotypes. I'm mentioning this because I would like to come to this, which is when we think about gender equality and inequality, 
in and through the media and ICT, there are at least uh, these uh, forms of inequalities uh, that we may take into consideration. So clearly, fair representation, the non-stereotypical giving all subjects, uh, women and other forms of diversity, a voice uh, that's crucial, but it's one thing. And then you come to equal, unequal working environments. Um, we were hearing yesterday about Davos uh, and the new data that has been promoted. Now there have been uh, some, some new reports on uh, the closing of gender pay gaps. Uh, Maybe interesting. I read some some uh, UK comments uh, over the last few days uh, saying that maybe all the struggles of feminists maybe we're seeing some change. Uh, okay, but in the media sector we're still witnessing this, and I wonder if any of you have been following what happened last year when the the Chinese editor of BBC, so BBC, uh, the main person, the main editor in China, Kerry Gracie she resigned from BBC, which is like world known, uh, taking as a model, uh, public uh, kind of media organization, once she discovered that, that all, all her male colleagues uh, who were in charge uh, of different regions, uh, from North America to the Middle East, uh, they were earning a lot more than she was uh, for the same job, and this was BBC. And the reason why now, this is interesting, when you say do policy matter, policy do not matter. In that case, what happened was uh, there was a law passed uh, by the UK Parliament uh, that uh, obliged uh, all companies, including media companies, to make transparent uh, the, tra the records uh, of the pay and salary. And only on that base, uh, because Kerry Gracie was able to see what had been negotiated by her colleagues, uh, she realized that she was earning, but not little less, she was earning like, uh, like 200,000 less uh, than her colleagues uh, working in the Middle East and Israel. And so she decided, you know, that was her, uh, her point, uh, and she resigned. And she said, I'm not staying in this company that is supposed to live up to the expectation. So we're not talking about m small companies uh, in countries in, transi in democratic transition, we're talking about BBC, okay? So the working condition still remains uh, a, very, uh, uh, a very important thing. Maternity, paternity leaves. Uh, mm, there's, there's a wide variety of situation across the world. Harassment and abuse. When we talk about the news media, we're witnessing a lot more of this uh, nowadays. Uh, and this is one of the major concerns. International Federation of Journalists, the OECD, a number of international organizations are addressing precisely this type of issue. Because the level of abuse and violence that women journalists and women who are speaking publicly, they experience online is uh, uh, one of the most worrisome things. Access to decision making is another thing. Media ownership. So one is who control politically the strategies and the other one is who control financially. Mm? 